Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's an honor and a pleasure for me to be among such a distinguished group of security and law enforcement experts and policymakers. I would like to thank um, Dean Raymond Gilpin and his team here at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies for inviting me to join you today. I also would like to thank uh, Mr. Thomas Dempsey for that great introduction. It's uh, nice to see you again. And I look forward to uh, a great discussion, a uh, fruitful discussion with you. My interest in security sector reform and transformation stems from development uh, on the ground across Africa in general, and in Central Africa in particular, as well as my military experience. I am a veteran of the United States Marine Corps, where I serve in different assignments uh, in the reserves, uh, including infantry, intelligence, and public affairs. While I do not understand the challenges your individual countries face, um, I think I have a very good appreciation of the work you are called to do and what your countrymen expect of you. In other words, I am one of you, a comrade in arms. So today I'm going to be talking about human security and state security and transformation in uh, Central Africa. The Central African region uh, remains unstable and in some areas quite volatile, as attested by the current development in Central African Republic. But before we, dis we dissect the general situation in Central Africa and the need for security sector reform and transformation, we first have to understand the types of armies that exist in Africa and how and why African countries got there. We should understand that history because it's critical in mapping out the road to change and transformation. Over the, over the last five decades of independence in Africa, four major categories of armies have emerged. The term army here uh, refers broadly to security institutions, including intelligence services and law enforcement outfits. The first category is the professional Republican army. This is a rare surviving breed of armies that stand for their countries. They serve the republic and the populations, not the regime or the strong men in power. They invest in their institutions, in training, equipment, and civic education. They have a clear line of command. The small list of armies includes Senegal, Ghana, Tanzania, and South Africa. In the case of Senegal, recently we saw what happened with the, the elections, the role the army played in steering the country in the right direction as President Wad tried to tamper with the Constitution and push the country into a crisis. In the case of Ghana, we've seen the evolution of Ghana as a country. First country independence, first country in leading the continent into a series of bloody coups that almost tore that, part, that country apart. But we've also seen since the late 90s, the country taking a turn, a positive turn, which has gone along with develop, uh, democratic development and sustainable economic development, so much as that today Ghana is considered a successful country. I will also, by the way, add Nigeria to that first category. Uh, the second category is the non-professional, adequate, and effective army. Right. So these are often old guerrilla forces or militias turned national armies. Right? They have a history of fighting a regime or a system. They also invest in, the, invest in the institutions, they train, they equip, and they also have a type of political indoctrination, not necessarily a civic edu uh, education. The needs of the popular, um, um, oh, sorry, so, but this, this army, while they invest and train and have a political indoctrination, serve either a strong man or a dominant ethnic group or regional interests or a combination of the two. They do not serve the republic, and the needs of the populations are subordinate to the survival of the regime. This category includes Republic of Congo, Uganda, Rwanda, Ethiopia, and Chad. The third category is the non-professional, inadequate, and ineffective army. Right? 
So these armies are built either on the remnant of old, strong, effective institutions, defunct guerrillas, or militias. There is very little investment in institutions, very little training, and very little equipment. Right? When money is dispersed for institution, it rarely reaches the target. There are parallel chains of command, and typically these armies are characterized by divided loyalty, inter-unit tension and rivalry, as well as discrimination within units and ranks. While these armies also try to serve a regime or strongman, there seems to be no coherent vision, no overarching policy. Examples of this army include the Democratic Republic of Congo, Burundi, South Sudan. The fourth category of army is a hybrid of the first three, and this includes the rest of the continent. So depending on where you sit, what your history is, often you have a mixed bag, which means we're still struggling to find armies that are professional, republican, and effective, which means armies that stand as the pillar of what my colleague Thierry Virculon was describing earlier in pushing for reform and being part of the solution. So the purpose, for the purpose of this discussion, Central Africa includes the Central African Republic, the Republic of Congo, Angola, South Sudan, Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, Tanzania, and Democratic Republic of Congo. There are several causes that have led to the current crisis uh, in, in Central Africa. Some of them are historical, and some of them are quite recent. The two main causes, historically, have been the Cold War. We know that countries in Africa, right after independence, were thrust into the Cold War, had to choose a camp quite uh, at the beginning, at the outset of their own emergencies countries. You were in one camp or in the other. For the Francophone countries, most of them just fell into the French umbrella of protection. Right? So the result was an undermining, constant and permanent, of the building of Republican armies. Mobutu could not have built a Republican army that would be sustainable if he's more concerned about surviving and serving Washington and Paris and Brussels. Right? The Nigerian, if they're serving the interests of France and France is going to protect them, why should they care as much? Because that will be guaranteed. And then in the 80s, we got to face structural adjustment. So while a lot of these young nations were struggling to build certain armies that were worth something, and in the case of DRC, we tend to forget that the Congolese army, the Zayan army, stood for something. At one point, it did work. This was the army that the US relied on in Angola. It was the army that trained a lot of neighboring countries. And even countries like the DRC, at one point, had an army that fell closer to the second category, an army that was partially professional, not fully Republican, but effective and adequate. It is the Zarian army that fought the communists in Angola. It was the Zarian army that trained all of the neighboring countries. It was the Zarian army that stopped Gaddafi in Chad with the, the, the Awuzu Strip. So with the distance of time, sometimes it's difficult to imagine that actually happened. It did happen. At one point, US officers were doing their advanced training in Zaire. I remember as late as 1988. US majors and other field officers were choosing as an option, instead of coming here at the War College or going to graduate institution across the country, we're going to Kinshasa and spending a year at the Centre Supérieur Militaire. And that training was fully recognized by the United States, which speaks of the quality of the military training at the time. Then, in, then a structural adjustment arrived. You know, we tend to forget this, it's very important. Countries in Africa were forced to embark on restructuring of their economies to fit the perspect perspective driven by Washington or London. This is the years of Margaret Thatcher and President Ronald Reagan. So with the turning off of the spigot, a lot of these countries were, were forced to reduce investment not only in health, or public education, but also in the military. So you can also trace that bad choice 
or set of bad choices country were facing with the decline of the quality of militaries across the continent. Um, so Cold War, protection from colonial powers, structural adjustment, um, that kind of set the trend of where we were going. That was the late 80s. Then the 90s arrived. The 90 arrives, remember La Conférence de la Bolle in France, where Mitterrand, during the Franco-African summit, served notice to African leaders and said pretty much that the era of strong men was over. You have to democratize. Benin took the lead. You know, everybody talks about South Africa as the, the usher of democratic change. But it was actually Benin that opened the gate with the national conference, Souverain, and all that stuff. So all that set us to the road where we got. Yeah? The change of democratization weakened people like Mobutu. Togo was in turmoil. There was Chad. He was going all over the place, leading us to the genocide in Rwanda. Right, 94, where, of course, the RPF is a rebel group, is fighting for the table, to sit, for a seat at the table. And the Arusha negotiation actually pushed them to have a certain number of seats in parliament, in the government, and so on and so forth. And then, kaboom, we have conflict, which is with us today in Central Africa. It is that conflict that spills into Congo. It is that, that conflict, starting in Uganda, comes to the other side. So the, spectro, the spectrum of challenges is quite comprehensive. On one hand, we have a dysfunctional state like the Democratic Republic of Congo, unable to deliver basic services. Uh, we have a militar militaristic and authoritarian regime in Kigali, uh, which tried to redefine the discourse. We also have, um, on the other side, Burundi. We heard about Burundi today, uh, which is, again, today at a different crossroad for democratization with different groups that had fought each other. We have Uganda. I was a kid when Museveni studied the Bush War. Today I'm speaking to you. Museveni is still in power, and Uganda is still pretty much a one-man show. Right? Uh, after destructive 30-year uh, war, Angola is emerging as a peaceful country. But still, the stability of a country like Angola hinges on the leadership of one man, Eduardo, Jose Eduardo dos Santos and one dominant party, the MPLA. Yeah. So in essence, there's only one country in Central Africa that fits the first category of professional army, that is professional republic, and it's Tanzania. Right? And we have this huge region which does not have a real anchor into traditional, uh, traditional republican armies. So what does this mean then in terms of um, what we need to focus on today. I want to focus on democratization and uh, security sector change. We cannot have real security sector reform or robust security sector in the region until we have real political change. Right? So we have political regimes that are holding an entire region hostage today because simply the peoples are not involved. So why is democratization important in this case? It's very important because part of the challenge that we face today is the definition of what security is. We go from the old model of the Cold War and structural adjustment, which meant security, meant state security. Yeah? And in that, in that model, state security focuses on the republic, the survival of the state, the survival of the regime. Everything else was secondary to that. The will of the people, whatever they want, was irrelevant as long as this strong man is holding the place together. Right? And in that sense, we doubt that we cannot have the most fundamental of political reforms, which uh, Thierry called security sector reform itself. Right? Um, this also means that the social contract, which is supposed to exist between the populations and the masses, is perverted. Right? The social contracts call from a give and take between the power that's in place and the people who are supposed to be the recipient of the services that are provided by the state. If the state is so worried about its own preservation at the expense of the masses, then the state will never deliver. The state sees the masses as an enemy 
not as a partner in a contract. You don't get a contract with your enemy. You have a contract with a partner. And so this way of looking at the world perverts everything. The intelligence services and everything else take precedence of to the welfare of the human of the being. So then on the other side, we have human security, and I think that's where the world is moving today. Right? So if we look at developed nations and we look at the different countries in Africa, it is the need for human security that are the source of the crisis. So in Central Africa, whether you want to talk about IDPs, which are over 2 million now in the region, IDPs do not just stay in Congo. They cross into Rwanda. They go into Uganda. Uh, the guy from Bangui come into northern Congo. So it's always a constant source of instability across the board. If the nations and the leadership in these nations are not using human security as the primary driver in the designs of security for the region, then we'll not have security. We'll continue having the same issues that we'll be dealing for now. In the case of the DRC, there's a problem with the legitimacy of the very system that is trying to restructure the security sector. And that cannot work because of the reason that I've just mentioned here. If the regime in Kinshasa is trying to survive, what incentive does the regime have to restructure the security? In that way, you can look at the conflict in the East as a good thing because it distracts people. You can just do the bare minimum and say that we're doing something, but 20 years later, you are still at the same place. To put in perspective, Mobutu fell in 1996. What? The war started in 1996, it fled the country in 1997. We are in 1213. 12, so kids who were born in 1997, kids who were born in 1997 are finishing high school today. So just to give you the cycle of what that means for a country, for a region, this is the regime they know. This is the reference. It's not the reference that I have. I can talk about Zaire intervening in Chad. The kid who was born in 96, who was going to college tomorrow, has no reference like that. So you just see what that does to a psyche in an entire region. So human security calls for good governance. It calls for democracy, because democracy is what makes the social contract between the state and the masses work. It means that the people can serve, can push the government to deliver their will. It means that the welfare and well-being of the masses is at the center of the political discourse. And security itself is determined so that it can protect the masses so the country can survive. The survival of the state then becomes equal to the survival of the individual. You cannot have a healthy nation with a population that is not healthy. You cannot have a happy nation with a miserable population. You have a military with which the population does not identify. Totally different. And then um, finally, an important element of this human security element, which Thierry also mentioned, is civil society. So if you take a place like the DRC, if you read, you read all the governance index and you read economic indicator indexes, the, D, the DRC is probably performing at the minus level. And in many ways, everything that we've studied in school means that the DRC shouldn't exist. That then means the indicators we're looking at are wrong. Right? They are wrong because they're irrelevant in most of these places. The DRC exists. It's moving forward. We cannot measure it in a quantitative way. But in part, it's because there's a strong civil society component in DRC. In fact, it's probably the strongest civil society component in the region. And I'll just give you a simple example. Because resources are such an important part in DRC and causing conflict and fueling conflict, you know, the DRC is part of the Extractive Industry Transparency Index initiative, EITI. And a few months ago, the DRC was suspended from EITI. The DRC was suspended from EITI because they found a discrepancy between the revenues that were being declared. You know, everybody's talking about DRC registering a tremendous economic growth, right? GDP growth, 8% and all that. But then they saw that there was a big gap between what was being declared and what was going to the coffers, the national coffers. And so DRC suspended. 
Now, Congo Brazzaville is not suspended. Angola is not suspended. Other countries are not suspended. Does anybody in this room believe that Angola or uh, Congo Brazzaville is much more transparent than Congo Kinshasa? No. What is missing in Angola and in Chad and Brazzaville and others is a strong civil society that can play that oversight role. And that is very important. So it's very important that people in uniform, policymakers, and others sit around the table with civil society in defining what is happening, especially in a country where the government does not represent the will of the people. So that's internally. There's a, there's a regional component to this. In the traditional state security definition and way of looking at things, when your neighbor is weak, you want to step on him. You want to give him a coup de grace. Right? So Zaire is struggling, Mobutu is sick, all the neighbors get together to drive him out without thinking about what that's going to do to the region. So the personal conflict between different leaders is paramount to what really needs to be for the security of the region. So we drive Mobutu out. Big success. Hupra. But then what happened? What happened is a mess for the next 10 years. Your neighbor is weak. He's trying to rebuild an army. Instead of helping him, you arm militias so can, they can drive him down. But by arming militias, you're creating your own fall. Because every regime is on a trajectory. And that trajectory always goes like this. There is no trajectory that always goes like this. So whether it's Uganda, whether it's Rwanda, I think they're on the other side of the apex now. What does that mean in the region? There's another model. Our neighbor is weak. Our neighbor is important. Let's work together in rebuilding our neighbor so that we will be safe. Rwanda will never be safe as long as the DRC is not safe. Right? Uh, the DRC is bigger. It has more territory. It provides more incentive for solution in the long run than a problem. Right? So what do we do? We look at the case of the United States and Mexico. Mexico doesn't make the news very often, but northern Mexico is in chaos. It's like Eastern Congo. You know, gang groups have taken over the place. Special forces turn drug dealers are ruling all over the place. The US, can, the U.S. can choose to drive Mexico down. This is the African model, right? Mexico is weak, so we're going to fuel, we're going to have some proxies and give them more reason to do the conflict. Or the US can provide assistance to Mexico because this affects everything that the US cares for. It, it affects security at the border, it affects immigration, it affects trade. You don't want a bunch of people laundering money across the, the border. So just to give a sense on what this means. So for me, region solution will require that the, the leaders of the regions those who are a bit stronger, the Museveni's of the world, the Kagame's of the world, start thinking differently beyond their own survival, right? And start engaging their neighbors beyond the hegemonic approach. It is great to be a strong man in the region, but it doesn't serve you well if your own country is sitting on a, on a fault line that will collapse tomorrow, right? Um, human security also means regional cooperation in the real sense of the word. This is what the nationalistic nation of Europe understood with the creation of the EU. In Africa, we all talk about free movement of good and, 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 and persons. But we do very little to make it successful. It's working well in ECOWAS. But it's not working well in Central Africa or even in, in Southern Africa. Um, if there is strong collaboration, then we have a chance to reduce, in the long term, to reduce the uh, big number of IDPs that we have, people can go back and contribute to the economies across the board. So in essence, transformation for the security sector starts with the change of our definition of what security is. In Africa, we know what security is. We know what brutality is. The moment that we can relate, those in uniform can relate, or civilian can identify with those in uniform, or policy makers don't see the civilians as a source of danger for them, then we'll move forward. But in the end, in the, state, in the old state model, the, the state determines the kind of army that we have. In the new model, the army is part of the drivers, the determinant of the type of states we have. And this is why the first category I mentioned, the professional Republican army, remains the 
only way to go. This is why Senegal is working. This is why um, Ghana is working. This is why Tanzania is working. Thank you. I look forward to a great discussion. <laughs>